Hey everyone, welcome to Career Journey Podcast. Today's episode features a colleague of mine, Rachel Soicher. Rachel is a PhD student at Oregon State University studying cognitive psychology with an emphasis on the scholarship of teaching and learning. In today's episode, you'll hear about how she started with a passion for being a doctor, how that morphed into a desire to do research in neuroscience, how she ended up in psychology by marking the wrong program on her graduate school application, all the way to where she is now with a passion and emphasis on teaching and learning. So without further ado, please enjoy Rachel Soicher. Hey everyone, welcome to the Career Journey Podcast, where we explore exciting careers and how to get them from the people who've lived it. I'm your host, Brittany Avila. Thank you for tuning in and enjoy. Hi, Rachel. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Brittany. Thanks so much for having me. (laughs) Thanks for being on. I'm really excited to share your journey. I know a little bit about it, and so I think it's perfect for our listeners to show a little bit about how a career journey might not always be quite a straight line. I think that it's it's safe to say mine was definitely not a straight line. (laughs) All right. Well, then without further ado, let's get into talking about it. So usually on this podcast, I like to start from the beginning. So let's talk a little bit about kind of your childhood and what what did you want to be when you were a child? Uh, so when I was little, I was always going to be a doctor for as long as I can remember. Um, nobody in my family is a doctor. Nobody in my family has ever gone to college. Um, but I excelled at school pretty early and I moved into a gifted program around first grade and I loved reading and I loved science and I loved math. So, um, for, yeah, for as long as I can remember, I wanted to be a doctor and I wanted to help people. Um, And oddly enough, uh, and I only mention this because it didn't really turn out this way later in life, I really wanted to be a mom and I really wanted to be a wife. And I am one of those things and no longer interested in being the other. (laughs) As a person with two kids, I don't blame you. (laughs) Yeah, I I can't imagine working in a pandemic with children. But um, so those were like the three things at the top of my list. I was doctor, mother and wife. Nice. Um, When you wanted to be a doctor, did you have a certain field that you were interested in or anything or you just wanted to help people? Not as a kid. I just knew like, okay, I'm going to medical school. And so I spent, you know, all of my time figuring out what do I need to do to go to medical school. And um, when I was in college, or sorry, when I was in high school, I was like, yeah, I'm definitely going to Harvard. I'm definitely going to an Ivy League school. Um, I was in a really strong, uh, like, international baccalaureate program and a math science engineering program. Um, And then I went, so I'm from Florida, and I went to visit Harvard in a, during spring break. So, like, March, Okay. And it sleeted the entire time my mom and I were there for my campus visit. And we came home and I was like, I am not leaving Florida. I refuse. <laughs> I will never live somewhere with weather like that. Um, and so I ended up at the University of Florida instead of Harvard. I love that it was the weather that kept you from Harvard. <laughs> that is amazing. Yeah. And I I mean, I would, you know, probably people are thinking like, well, could you have even gotten into Harvard? And we'll never know because also at the high school I was at, um, we just had to fill out like this one page form and then they submitted it on our behalf to all of the state schools. And so I just did that one form and I was like, I'll go to a state school. So I never even applied out of state. I just was like, they were like, you're pretty much guaranteed admission with graduating from this program to any state school. And I was like, yeah, that's fine. Um, And it turned out that was a really good choice for me because I accrued zero dollars in student debt um, in college. Yeah. That is perfect. That is definitely something to consider when choosing colleges of how to get out without debt, which is Mm -hmm. pretty impossible nowadays. Um, I did the same thing. I only applied to the one school of the town I grew up in. I had almost forgot to apply for schools and applied <laughs> like the last week it was due. Perfect. Um, so you went to a school in kind of where you grew up or at least in the same state. Mm-hmm. Um, when you went to undergraduate, did you immediately jump on kind of how to 
go into med school, so pre-med? Absolutely. I was pre-med track from day one. Um, I was not really sure what my major was going to be, but I was taking, you know, chemistry and microbiology. And um, I'd say for probably the first two years, I was really uh, uncertain, but I had done some study abroad thanks to a scholarship that I received. And so around my sophomore year, I was really getting interested in keeping up with my Spanish classes that I had started in high school. And it, I really loved languages. And I was like, oh, I can be like a doctor without borders. Like, this is going to be amazing. So I was able to create my own interdisciplinary major where all of my bachelor core courses were in neurobiological sciences and all of my electives were the courses I would need to simultaneously earn a bachelor's in Spanish literature. So I ended up graduating with two bachelor's degrees um, because I was able to sort of stack them together that way. And um, yeah, I joined like whatever the student association is for, you know, pre-med college students and I was trying to figure out how to volunteer. Then I realized I would need research experience. So I started working in a lab at the McKnight Brain Institute um, doing cognitive control research with patients with traumatic brain injury. So that was sort of my my shtick while I was in college. That's great. Um, so where did you go next? So you're saying you graduated with these two bachelor's degrees. You were at that lab. And then how did you decide where to go after graduation? Yeah, so I don't know who in college talks to college students about where they should go next, um, but no one talked to me about what I should do next. And I had decided in my, um, so the summer between my junior and senior year, I spent a summer in Seattle and I got certified as a um, certified nurse's assistant. And as part of that program in the last two days, you have to volunteer for two full days in a local nursing home. Um, And it was immediately clear to me after those two days, I was not cut out for medicine. I was like, I can't (laughs) handle it. I like everybody is so sad and everybody's so sick and like I feel so helpless. And so I was like, done, not being a doctor. So like all of my doctor dreams my whole life came like crashing down. And I was like, two days. (laughs) Yeah, in two days, literally, that was all it took. I was just like, nope, not for me. Um, Not that being a doctor is anything like... uh, you know, being a um, nurse, but then I also like was struggling in like my organic chemistry classes and I was, you know, feeling a little bit worried that I wouldn't pass the MCAT or get enough, a high enough score to get into medical school. So it was like self-doubt plus like this experience. And I was just like, yeah, what do I do now? Um, so I was like, well, I'm really good at school. I should just stay in school. I'll go to that grad school. That was my school. thought, exactly. <laughs> like, uh, no one told me grad school is not anything like being in college. But here I was, you know, 22 years old thinking, oh, this will be exactly the same. Um, so I applied to two schools. I applied to a neuroscience program at University of Florida. Um, I interviewed there, was a, offered a fellowship. And then I also applied to UC Davis to work with um, a researcher who was collaborators with the PI that I was in his lab at the McKnight Institute. And um, this probably isn't how people want to tell their children how to make decisions, but my husband also applied both places. Uh, He was not my husband at the time, but uh, he only got into UC Davis. So to UC Davis, we went um, Mm. because we I actually, I think that's a great thing. I tell my students all the time that other things in your life do matter. So relationships, location, point. close to family, money. A lot of times I hear people saying, oh, well, I'm not supposed to think of that in terms of a career. And I'm like, that's your life. You're definitely supposed to think of those things. Yes. And I have uh, grown to appreciate those things a lot, um, especially now. So, so we moved to California and uh, I was in also just like I'll just tell all of these embarrassing things about myself. You know, like I'm a strong feminist. So like to say, oh, I moved across the country because, you know, my, my boyfriend also got into school seems silly. Um, and also it seems silly. I meant to apply to a neuroscience program at Davis. And when the time came to fill out the application, I applied to the psychology program and didn't even realize till later that it wasn't the one that I meant to apply to. 
Wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, so my husband got like invited out for visiting weekend and was offered a fellowship at Davis. He's got his PhD in biomedical engineering. And all the while I heard nothing, just like crickets. And I was like, I'm pretty sure like I'm going to get in what's happening. And I kept calling and they kept saying like, we're reviewing applications, like, please stop contacting us. <laughs> and I was like, okay. Um, but then comes to find out they actually did lose my application. So they called me and they were like, we're really sorry that this happened. Um, we want to put you in touch with the PI you're interested in working with. And basically like, if he says he'll take you, then you can come. So I had a half hour phone call with this guy. He was like, yeah, sure. You sound great. Come on out. And I was like, okay, great. Um, so we moved to California and that was the fall of 2007. Well, it's a good thing you kept calling them because right? they noticed that they missed your application. If you hadn't called them, they might not have ever known. Yeah, <laughs> life life works in funny ways. Um, so luckily that program had like a perception, cognition and cognitive neuroscience like sub branch that I was able to enroll in and actually take a lot of neuroscience classes. So that was still, you know, primarily where my interests were. Um, but to receive funding in that program, I started TAing and I TAed um, a few really large research methods courses and I really enjoyed it. So I asked if I could TA like my own um, what do you call it? Like my own section, like recitation section um, of a memory and cognition class. So they let me do that. Um, and then I was like, wow, I really like this teaching thing. I don't, I don't know what this is about. And let me talk to my advisor. And they were like, no, stop liking teaching. This is a research institute. You need to be doing research. And I was like, okay, cool. So um, I'm going to teach though, but I won't tell you about it. <laughs> so there so was you did it behind their back. <laughs> I did. So there was a, the local community college offered this faculty diversity internship program where you went for like if you got accepted, it was like 10 weeks of professional development about how to teach at community colleges. Yeah. Um, and then you got to shadow a community college instructor. So I got in, took that workshop in the fall and in the spring, they happened to be hiring an adjunct for biopsych. So I applied, got that job. So they were like, obviously, you're not going to shadow anyone. You're just going to teach your own course. And I had never taught my own course before. Uh, but I did it. And I and I loved it. And I just didn't tell anybody. <laughs> just It was my like little teaching secret. Um, so then that was in 2010. And simultaneously, what had kind of been happening at school was I was doing research that I just did not care about. Um, and I had already transferred away from my first PI to a second PI in the department who was doing language research. Um, and I thought I might be able to do like bilingualism research, but that ended up not really fitting in with what the lab was already doing. Um, and so for my dissertation, I was kind of working towards using EEG to measure basically how peop people perceive like weird grammar structures when they're reading language. And every time I had to write like a broader impact statement, it was just like torture. I was like, I don't like, I'm sure somebody could reason how this EEG data is going to apply to like little kids learning to read or something, but I just don't see the connection. So I was becoming super disenfranchised with my research because I just was like, it's not helping anybody, but like, look in the classroom, I can literally see people like learning and making connections and I'm building relationships with people. Like our lab was separate from the rest of the department. So it felt kind of like lonely and I was missing Florida. It was just like all of these things combined. So the more I started to like teaching, the less work I was doing at school. Um, I earned my master's in 2009 started teaching in 2010. And in 2011, uh, my advisors were like, yeah, so you're in your fourth year and you're not making enough progress and we need you to like really buckle down. And I was like, well, instead of buckling down, I'm going to go. And they were like, go where? And I was like, I'm going to leave the program. Were they and shocked? Yeah, I don't think that happens very often. Shocked. Uh, absolutely shocked. I think, um, it felt like a very aggressive meeting to me. Like I have this memory of feeling like I was blindsided because I thought I was meeting with just one of them, but then both of them were at this meeting. And obviously they weren't like giving me good news, but 
of course, they weren't mean about it or anything. They just were trying to like motivate me. Um, and had you decided that you were leaving before no. that meeting or was it spur of the moment? So I had that meeting. I left that meeting, cried myself like three blocks away from campus to a park, sat on a park bench sobbing for like two hours. Then I had lunch with my husband and I was like, what do you think I should do? We were married at this point. I was like, I just like, what will we do? You know, we're making $19,000 a year. I can't just not have a job. You know, should I just finish? I've never quit anything in my life. What will this say about me as a person if I leave this PhD program? And he was just like, do you want to teach? And does that feel right to you? And I was like, yes. And he was like, then just leave. And I was like, oh, okay. Yeah. It's- they make it sound so simple. Sometimes. I know. So I did. I just went in and I was like, yeah, so I'll finish the term and then I'm going to go. And that was wow. pretty much the end of it. That's like everybody's dream to walk into a job and just quit, right? <laughs> like they do in movies. <laughs> I wish that I had realized at the time what what a right decision it was for me, but I spent many years, unfortunately, really feeling like I made the wrong decision that um, I don't know that it was a failure, like a tremendous failure on my part and that I had let everyone down and that I would never make it without my PhD. Um, Yeah. So I wish I would have like realized a little bit sooner that it was totally fine to make that decision. (laughs) And you said it took like a few years for you to kind of come to terms with it? I would say, um, so I was adjuncting. I ended up Uh, getting referred to a couple other campuses in the Sacramento area. So I ended up adjuncting at three different community colleges. Um, And I got like more interested in learning about how to be a better teacher. And so I went to NITOP for the first time. Um, The National Institute for the Teaching of Psychology is a large conference held annually in Florida. So I went for the first time. I got a little bit of professional development money I think in 2011 or 2012 was my first trip there. And I met other community college instructors with master's degrees and they didn't seem to be bothered at all that they just, that they just, I'm using air quotes, that they just had a master's or that they only had a master's, right? They were just like, yeah, I know. They were just like, why do you need to have more school than like what you need to have the job you want? Actually, Sue France said that to me once. And it is advice I give to all of my students. Every day. Don't go to more school than you need to have the job you want. Every day. Because then you end up in a spot where you're overqualified for jobs and you can't get them. (laughs) <laughs> that happened to my husband when he graduated. Yeah, when I was in my master's program, I was trying to just work as like a barista or, you know, anything to just make extra income during my master's. And they're like, you have a bachelor's and you're going for your master's. You're overqualified. You're not going to stay in this job. And I'm like, I need food. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But. When my husband graduated, he wanted a job in industry like R&D for biomedical engineering. And everywhere was just like, we have enough PhDs. We're just hiring people with their master's degrees. Um, And he even thought about like taking his PhD off his resume, but he didn't actually have a master. So he felt a little bit weird about it. Um, So he didn't. And he ended up in a job he hated for like a long time. (laughs) And see, it's something I think we don't explain enough to young people that a higher degree is not necessarily better. It depends on what you want to do. Absolutely. And I get that from students every day of, oh, well, I just need to get a PhD because that's the highest degree I can go to. And it's like, well, what do you want to do? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So you're kind of in turmoil at this point, thinking about maybe making a wrong decision at any point during that t- time. Did you debate going back into that PhD program? No. and just? No. Mm-mm. Okay. No. So you were conflicted about do about the decision, but not about going back into it. I was. So in a, in addition to my adjuncting, though, I had also started working doing contract work, like consulting for uh, like applied research. So um, like projects that the state of California would like hire people to you know analyze data and write up reports about stuff. And I worked on a lot of different projects, and I thought like, well, this kind of like hands on research could be really cool. 
Um, but I still don't know if I want to like do it all the time. Like I just love teaching so much. So as my husband like neared the end of his PhD, I started looking for full-time teaching positions because I was like, this is for sure what I want to do the rest of my life. And at that point, my sort of self-doubt like, oh, did I make the right decision? I should have gotten my PhD kind of turned into, I have this very like defensive personality, unfortunately. So I was just like, research is stupid. No one needs to do research. People should just commit themselves to teaching. And when people would ask me like, do you ever think you'll go back to school? No. Why would I ever go back to school? Of course, I never want to be in a PhD program ever, ever again. For anyone who doesn't know, there is this adversarial nature between kind of the applied I do research specifically to help individuals and to kind of get out into the world and give the research to people and people that research for research six. There's yes. sometimes an adversarial nature. So you're not far off in, in your thinking on that line. Yes. And and I mean, now I, I recognize the value of knowledge for knowledge sake, um, but it's not the right fit for me. And um yeah, so spoiler alert, I am back in grad school in a PhD program that I never, ever, ever would have ever gone back to. <laughs> uh, All right, so walk so, us through how you ended up back in a PhD program. How so did you're I end up back looking, there? So you're looking for full-time jobs. Yeah, so that was around 2013, and um, I applied to four positions. I was invited to interviews at three of them. I went to interview at two of them and I was offered a job at both of them. Um, and we ended up back in Gainesville, actually. At, um, I was at Santa Fe College and we moved there primarily because we thought the industry options for my husband when he finished his PhD would be really good there. So we lived there for about a year um, before my husband was able to find a job. He didn't get a job in Gainesville. He ended up getting a job in Tallahassee. So I left my full-time teaching position to move to Tallahassee, but I was able to get another tenure-track teaching position at a small community college in rural Georgia. Just teaching there, um, but it turned out we did not enjoy living there. Um, we really missed California or like the West Coast. And we had some friends um, from grad school in California that had moved up to Oregon. And the one was in Matt's grad program and was doing work very similar to what he was doing. And she was like, we're hiring, you should move out here. Like, please come. And I was like, yes, let's go. <laughs> um, so we moved again and we ended up here in Corvallis. And I was just um, teaching a couple of classes at the local community college and also working retail. So that was my life for like a year. And I was like, oh my God, I'm so bored. And I just want to be teaching more. Um, so, you know, I was on the constant lookout for jobs. And I went to um, the Psych One teaching conference at Stanford. And I met the woman who is now my advisor, Dr. Kathy becker Blease, And she was like, hey, we're starting a PhD program in our department at Oregon State. And I want to do scholarship of teaching and learning research. And if you're into it, like you should apply. And I was like, let me consider my options. So while I was teaching full time at Santa Fe, I did the scholarship of teaching and learning like writing workshop that coincides with the annual conference on teaching and had actually designed and executed a, a study about student metacognition um, in community college settings. I worked on that with um, Dr. Regan Gurung, and that went really well. And I was like, for the first time, I was like, oh my gosh, people can do research on stuff that matters. That's like really interesting and applied and immediately helpful. Um, and so when uh, Kathy mentioned to me like, oh, do you think you'd want to do research like this? I was like, yes, I didn't know that was an option for for what to do. It hasn't been for a while. I <laughs> wish I would have had that PhD program come about. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and again, I kind of mentioned this jokingly, but like only half jokingly, you know, when I was talking about it with my husband and he was like, are you sure that's like a commitment that you want to make? I was like, well, I haven't been able to get a full-time job and they will pay me better to be a grad student than I'm currently making 
at the community college. So, and I'll get to teach. That's another thing about teaching. I think a lot of people don't know is the pay scales are very different for different types of teaching, different places. Sometimes you're not making that much money. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, Corvallis is not like a very high cost of living. Um, there's no sales tax in Oregon, which is kind of nice. Um, but still, I was like, okay, it would be nice to have something like more regular. And um, I started out teaching two classes a quarter uh, while being enrolled in school as like instructor of record, which is also not something most programs offer to incoming grad students. But yeah. So now I'm four years into that program. Um, and to go back to that instructor of record, for those that are interested in teaching and don't know, um, being a TA, a teaching assistant, is not considered the same thing as instructor of record, where instructor of record, you're actually in charge of the class. You're teaching the class. You're listed. That's what people are looking for when you're applying to teaching jobs to make sure that you've held a class kind of in your hands. Absolutely. Yeah. That you've made the syllabus that maybe you've picked the textbook. Maybe you don't have that option. Um, so one of the goals I think that the department has for our PhD program specifically is to be a PhD program that embraces pedagogical training for graduate students. So this idea that even if you leave and you don't want to have a job in academia, the skills that you acquire from teaching are just so widely applicable. Like they've improved everything about my research. I think more critically about my research. Um, I involve my students in my research. I um, present my research more articulately, you know, I'm yeah, it's helping me be more articulate. Can't you tell? <laughs> <laughs> So there's a lot to be said about the benefits of learning how to teach um, beyond just, you know, putting a line on your CV when you go to apply for a job. And if you are planning on going into academia, I can't imagine, like, when I think about even my transition from an adjunct to a full-time instructor was really difficult. And when you start teaching at a, at a college, or I assume it's the same at a university, there's all these other things you're expected to do outside of teaching like service work, committee work, and then you're new and fresh. So everybody's like, yeah, you'll want to help out, like help us here and help us here and lead this committee. And I'm like, I'm new. Are you sure me? They're like, yeah, no one else will do it. And then so, you know, you're stuck doing all this other stuff besides teaching. So I just imagine that having that authentic experience under your belt so that you're not totally lost at that, plus all the new things you're trying to learn when you start a new job has got to be just wonderful. And even just teaching itself is not just teaching. It's not what students see where they see you come into the classroom, teach for an hour and walk away. It's mm -hmm. all the stuff behind the designing the course, making sure everything's there for a reason, mm -hmm. all of that. How did all of that compare to your previous PhD program where they didn't want you to teach at all? <laughs> so I, it's funny, I feel like I'm always the counterpoint to... PhD naysayers now. Like if you'd have asked me, you know, in 2013, I'd have been like, yeah, PhD is stupid. Never get one. Why would you ever want to be in grad school? It's the hardest. It's the worst. But now, like on Twitter, when people are like, PhDs are so hard, it's like, yeah, a PhD is not easy. But when you're in a PhD program, that's a good fit for you. Like I have never been happier. I would stay, in, I would like repeat this PhD experience if I was able to, like, I'm kind of scared get to get a real money. job. <laughs> like, yeah, but you know, my husband makes money. It's fine. <laughs> like, and I do, and I do recognize um, that I, I do try to mention that to people fairly often. Um, a lot of people go to graduate school without financial support. Um, but I am fortunate. My husband makes enough money that I don't need to be making a lot of money. Um, and so I do have, I do recognize that that's a privilege. So, um, you know, I have a lot of other graduate students in our program who live paycheck to paycheck, and that's a stressor that they have on top of grad school that I don't deal with. Um, so I know it's it's a, it makes it a little bit easier for me to be like, yeah, everything is wonderful. But it sounds like it is wonderful in terms of the academic side of it when you have that perfect fit. So finding that perfect fit is key. 
Right. And I don't have any magical advice for people on how to find a good fit, but Kathy and I work extremely well together. And she is, you know, whenever you hear people talk about like pulling other people up with you when you're in a good position, like that is her to a T. So she's really looked out for me from day one. Um, I've been really explicit with her about what my goals are. And so she, where she's seen an opportunity, um, to allow me like leadership on something that grad students wouldn't normally be considered for. Like she's just really advocated for me to be involved in that. So uh, for example, we started offering hybrid courses up in Portland at a Portland campus. And I was the one that designed the curriculum for two classes to be offered up there. And I know I have never heard of students being offered that kind of opportunity in a graduate program. So, um, you know, I had the experience to do it. So it's not like I was underqualified or something. But um, yeah, it's been a really great experience for me. So you would suggest finding not only a program fit, but a mentor fit as well? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, that's something that I think a lot of students don't know either is when you go to interview for grad programs, you're interviewing them just as much as they're interviewing you. Yeah, and I think it was helpful to me that I first got to know her in an informal context as um, as colleagues. Like, it was actually really funny when I started. I was like, do I need to call you Dr. Becker, please? Like, when we're at school. <laughs> um, and so it is, I mean, that's why I mentioned that I don't have any magical advice. Like, to some extent, you are just leaving yourself in the hands of fate, right? Like, there's only so much you can learn about a person by in- interacting with them once. But to the extent that you're able, um, talking to other students who have worked with that PI is probably the best way to go. Um, and if they have more than one grad student, you should talk to more than one grad student because sometimes people's experience is a result of them and not the advisor necessarily, you know, it's like people can be very nice, but still not be easy to work with um, or vice versa, like really easy to work with, but maybe don't have the experience that um, you need for something like Kathy's very well networked. She has a lot of experience. Her trajectory was also very, um, non-linear, I would say, to her current position. So she knows a lot about like side hustling and doing things you don't want to for a little while until the right opportunity comes along. So um, I think that that insight is helpful. Great. And can you walk us through a little bit about kind of what your day-to-day life looks like in your current PhD program? What types of things are you doing? Yeah. Um, Well, right now I'm writing my dissertation. So I spend lots of hours at home in front of my computer reading and writing. Uh, But it's something that I love. Like I love the topic that I'm working on. So I'm investigating the use of what's called a utility value intervention in intro psych classes. Um, And something else that I would point out um, if some of the audience members of this podcast are like interested in going to graduate school and that's sort of why they're listening. Um, When I started grad school, a member of my committee mentioned to me um, that there's no time better than grad school because you just have all this freedom to like read widely in psychology and think about ideas and that once you start as a faculty member, you don't have time to do that anymore. And I totally scoffed. I was like, this is so much work. How do you perceive this to be fun or enjoyable at all? And, you know, see, are you noticing a trend? I have like really strong opinions and then they change immediately. (laughs) Spoken like a scientist. (laughs) Yeah, I guess so. Um, And it really like preparing for my um, comprehensive exams. I just spent like six months just reading all the things I could get my hands on. And it was like such a joy to learn like, oh, these are historical theories of like achievement motivation. And this is like what they are currently. And these are the methods that we draw on. And um, I read like fairly widely because I have a few social psychologists on my committee. Um, I had a committee member who's um, into like Bayesian statistics and open science methods. So I had a bunch of that like on my reading list for comps. And I think having that 
what I did perceive to be like true freedom to just like kind of read and think about ideas and toss ideas around um, actually really helped push me in a direction for my dissertation that previous, you know, before that I had thought like, oh my gosh, what will I ever do for my dissertation? I have no original ideas like whatsoever. It um, took me so long to figure out. I was asking everyone, what am I supposed to do for my <laughs> dissertation? I have no idea. How am, how am I supposed to just create an idea? Yeah. <laughs> it's a hard um, task. So my dissertation actually sprung up from I went in my second year to a talk in the public health school at OSU um, to see uh, Dr. Russell Glasgow, who's a very prominent public health researcher. And he was talking about a field called implement dissemination and, and implementation science. And he was talking a lot about how it's important to measure the process of actually using evidence-based practices, um, you know, in his context, usually like prevention medicine and things like that. Uh, and then that was like the way you were going to be able to get people to really use evidence-based practice in a more widespread fashion. And I don't know, it just like really stuck with me. So it, it kept coming up for me as I was reading through all of these psych specific resources for my comps. Um, and then once I passed them, I kind of had this inkling of like, how can I tie in this implementation science idea to what I'm doing? And so I spent from like, January to September teaching myself implementation science. And I ended up going to an implementation science conference that was in Seattle alone um, just to see like, what is this about? Um, and I got into like the student network with that organization. And I was paired with a mentor who's uh, you know, an early career researcher in implementation science. And as I was working on my dissertation proposal, she was like reading it and giving me feedback. So yeah, I guess like be brave and <laughs> look for resources outside of where you might think they exist. Um, and do you think your unconventional journey to this career or to your point right now kind of maybe helped you in that area? Because you probably went to that health science talk because you have a history of wanting to be a doctor, wanting to be in health sciences. Do you think that that helped you think more interdisciplinary to kind of come up with your current line of thought and your current dissertation? That's a really good question. I only hesitate because I've literally never asked myself that like, I've never thought about that before at all. Um, but it makes a lot of sense when you put it that way. Um, I do think I've also just for as long as I can remember had just a fundamental love of learning and I've always just like whatever I can get my hands on, especially reading wise is like, I just eat up new information and every class I took in this PhD program, I went into like totally excited to learn about it. You know, even if I didn't think it was going to be like important for me or in my wheelhouse. Um, and I was just talking to a prospective grad student the other day, like, if you come into grad school thinking you already know what your path is and being really certain about it, you miss out on a lot of those learning opportunities because you're unable then to see the ways in which these other seemingly tangential things could actually be readily applied to what you're doing. So I do think just being like open minded about stuff is helpful. In my PhD program, a lot of students that were in at the same time as me would often make fun of me because I would be retaking classes because I did the route where I got my master's at a different university and then switched into a PhD program. So I had a lot of classes that could transfer over mm -hmm. and I retook them and everyone was like, why are you retaking the same class when you can just get out of it and just go into research right away? And I was like, I want to see how different people teach it. I want to see what it looks like from a different viewpoint. Um, someone with a different perspective is going to teach me differently or is going to teach me something that the other class didn't. And I really wanted to compare those together. Yeah. And everyone thought I was crazy, but <laughs> it led me to teaching. So. Yeah. I mean, that's a great insight to have because especially in grad seminars, which you, you know, are so different from an undergraduate course where you like, you know, an intro psych, every textbook is like a 16 chapter textbook with set topics. But in a grad seminar, it's basically up to the instructor to decide like, what stuff do I want the students to read? And how do I want us to think about it together? So, 
yeah, it's going to be incredibly different depending on the instructor that you have for it. Um, and I kind of chuckle to myself when other students come in with their masters and they're like mad, our department won't let them out of, you know, like their core classes or something. I'm like, this is the fun of being in school. <laughs> I know. I think people have different approaches when they go to grad school, exactly what they want to get sure. out of it. Yeah. And you know, and it's funny because now that I'm back, I'm older by eh, eight years at least, <laughs> like than everybody else um, that's in the program. And so I think they, they would have every right to be like really annoyed by my motherly, like I have whatever is the best suggestion for how you should approach your graduate education. <laughs> and they're just like, no, we know what we want to do. We're also adults. I'm like, oh yeah. <laughs> I had the same thing. Everyone in mine, I remember they were like turning 20 or 21 and I was almost 30 and I was just like, what are you guys doing with your lives every day? You're actually like going out and doing crazy things. <laughs> I'm just reading. <laughs> yeah. I'm glad I got that out of my system. I do think going back as an older person, that sounded weird, um, but coming back to school when I'm older, I definitely just have you know, you change so much between when you're 25 and when you're 35. It's just, you don't see it when you're 25. You don't think like, oh, I'll be any different at all. But you do just have so many more lived experiences and you have like gained a lot of perspective from those experiences. And so I do think now it's it's easier for me to focus on school because I, I know I chose it for a particular reason. I'm really happy that I'm here. Um, I joke around with everybody, like I have excellent life work balance. Uh, I mostly enjoy my life and then I work when I need to. Um, so I think like I didn't have that when I was 22 or 23 going into grad school the first time. Um, that yeah, was something so, I learned during my master's program was how to stop at six o'clock. Yeah. <laughs> Everything oh, after, so once I went it. home, I <laughs> A undergraduate, you know, you work those long hours, you're working at 2 a.m., you're getting everything done at crazy times. My master's was really where I was like, oh, I need to go home and go home mm -hmm. and sit and binge watch Netflix. Yeah. And the three years that I was adjuncting in California, I worked all the time. I just had like so much grading to do and I was driving so around so much. So I was losing a lot of like office time I might otherwise have. And my husband actually was like, okay, we're instituting a home rule. Like you have to have one weekend day off, completely off. Don't feel bad that you're not working. Like, and we can just enjoy ourselves. And I was like, okay, I can, I can give you one day <laughs> that I'm not working. Um, and that ended up being a real lifesaver to me during that time. But then also when I switched into my full-time job, although there were a lot more, there was a lot more expected of me the fact that I had an office to sit in all day meant that I literally only had to work from nine to five, even when I had a bunch of grading to do, or even though I was going to committee meetings. And so, you know, for two solid years, I was just like, oh, when you have a full-time teaching position, it is cake. <laughs> like, <laughs> this is so nice. I don't have to drive anywhere. <laughs> don't have to, you know, there's um, something to be said about the emotional toll of adjuncting. Um, you know, and never knowing like what your next classes are going to be, you know, when you're full time, you know, like almost a year in advance what all your classes will be and what times they'll be meeting. It's really nice and organized. Um, so I think the fact that I was like really in a good like regular work schedule helped me when I came back to grad school. I was just like, nope, that's my time. The school doesn't get that time for me. And they definitely don't get that time for me for $24,000 a year. <laughs> That is definitely a good thought to have of compensation. I feel the more compensation people get, the better they get at work-life balance. And mostly those jobs where you're working a lot of hours, a lot of time and not getting paid nearly enough for it. Yeah. My husband actually started a new job about six months ago and he really likes it. And, he, and now that we're home, he works like a ton and I keep telling him and I don't think he likes it, but I'm like, they're not paying you enough to work all these hours. Like you need to get a raise or you need to work less. Like you're just doing too much for them for what they're compensating you for. And he's like, I like my job. I'm like, that's great. But 
they would fire you in a heartbeat if they didn't need you. So just keep that in mind. I know. And that's, I think, the generational difference, too. I always debate with my parents about where they're so loyal to companies and then millennials and below, we don't feel that same tug. Well, to be fair, companies. though, like they, you know, that generation used to get into a job and the boss would also like work really hard to keep them and make sure that they were well taken care of. And I think like, yeah, in our generation, corporations aren't like that. They're just happy. Like they'll take the next person that'll work for less money than you because you're like a cog in the wheel. Yeah, which is exactly why workers are kind of doing the same thing, too. I think more more people are jumping from job to job than ever before. It used to be you mm-hmm. kind of somebody would recruit you out of your bachelor's degree, out of your college, and you'd work there for the rest of your life. And it just doesn't seem to be quite that job yeah. market anymore. Mm-hmm. All right. Yeah. So you are finishing up your dissertation right now. So mm-hmm. we're going to assume you're not going to stay in your PhD program forever, not, even if you I want to. So <laughs> what do you see as your next steps? Yeah. So um, just kind of bringing it back to what we already mentioned about how life circumstances are really important to keep in mind. Um, I think the academic, so I want to stay in academia. I obviously love teaching and I'm really committed to it. Uh, But now, you know, my stance on research has changed quite a bit. I would like my job to involve research um, in an official capacity, not just like in a do it in my spare time capacity. And uh, but now, you know, the academic culture really supports like move your family around all over the place until you find the job you want, you know, postdoc for a few years or take some temporary position and then eventually apply to the, you know, regular one you want. And the jobs are sparse and the candidates are many. And, you know, although I feel really well qualified for stuff, like there are equally qualified people for, you know, the same exact job. So um, super competitive job market, and I don't want to leave Corvallis, Oregon. So we're in, I've been in a bit of a pickle because, we, you know, we bought our first house here. Uh, we have three dogs, two of which are pit bulls. So it sounds silly, but it's like very difficult to move anywhere with those dogs, um, quantity yes. and type. Um, there aren't too many places I am willing to live. Like I really enjoy the West Coast. I no definitely snow, don't want to go to Florida. I don't want to live where it's snowing. <laughs> So, like, I have a lot of requirements about my climate. <laughs> um, so, basically, for as long as I can remember, I've just been putting it in, like, everybody's head that will listen at Oregon State that, like, I need a job at Oregon State. So, they should start preparing for that. Um, and it did not seem like that was actually going to be the case for me. But... Um, I guess I can say this, it's like public, like there's an instructor position open in our department that I'll be applying for. So um, hopefully by like the end of June, like about a month from now, I should know if I got that position or not. Um, and it's Good it's a on teaching that. only position, uh, which, it, you know, isn't perfect, but it keeps me here, which is a higher priority for me than what I'm actually doing in my day to day job. Um And also gets me a foot in the door should a tenure track position open in the future. So it also I found so I am in a current position exactly the same. I'm in a teaching only position and you can still do research. You just have to do it as an add on. So as you mentioned earlier about all that extra stuff you normally have to do when you're teaching, uh, the research just becomes an additional added on Mm -hmm. extra Yeah, for sure. So I think there are some projects, you know, obviously for like a year or two, I can still work on publishing my dissertation research, um, maybe get in on some like intro psych research that's happening in our department anyway. Um, That way I'm still publishing in that position to make me more competitive should, you know, a more permanent position become available. So that's sort of my my outlook right now. It's great. And I love, again, that you mentioned kind of how circumstances and other things play into your decision for where you want to work, especially something that seems as mundane as I have three dogs and two of them are pit bulls and it's hard to 
get into somewhere because that matters a lot. You don't, it does. <laughs> you know, and I think sometimes people are scared to admit that that stuff matters. And so it's nice to hear from somebody in a position that those are things you're consciously thinking about. Mm -hmm. Again, I should say like, you know, my husband has a job. So even if I had to be jobless, like we would be okay. So again, I don't have that pressure to like, you have to take a job somewhere, no matter what it is. Um, but even if you I'm had that pressure, those it. considerations would still be there. And Absolutely. so you'd still have to kind of figure out a way around that too. Well, we're coming up close to time now. So I want to just ask kind of one last question about anyone starting on their career journey, maybe thinking about going to graduate school. What kind of advice do you think you would give them? Yeah, I mean, I just have to go with my golden rule, which is... Um, if you think you know what kind of job you want to have, go to a job search engine and like look for those jobs and see what degree they require and get that degree. That's, it, I think it's kind of golden. I had a student um, who reported last year uh, that she did that. And then she, you know, she wanted to be like an art therapy or something like that. And then she was like, oh, I'm, you know, those programs are really expensive. The job's are really rare. And while I was researching it, I found out you can have like X, Y, and Z jobs. And so I actually am going to go into a PsyD program. She had no intention of like going into a doctoral program, um, but she like applied and was accepted a couple of places. Um, so I think if you, I never personally did that, but I think if you can look at like job sites and kind of see like, what are the types of jobs you think you'd like to have, definitely don't be overqualified for them because it does, I mean, I'm glad you mentioned this, um, that, you know, we're not the only one that had that experience that if you're overqualified, people also don't hire you. It's not like they're like, yeah, great. You have all these additional skills. They see you immediately as somebody who won't stay in that job because you're not being paid enough to do it, or it's not challenging enough. Exactly. Something again, that we don't normally tell people. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that was great advice. And then something from your story too, to kind of keep in mind is maybe try that job out if you have an opportunity to, because two days can completely yeah. <laughs> change your career path. <laughs> yeah. It's the little things, you know, when they happen, you're like, oh no, what will I do for the rest of my life? And then hindsight bias, you're just like, yeah, I'm so glad that that worked out. <laughs> I'm so glad I never did that job that I dreamed yeah. about my entire childhood. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Yeah, it's been great. Thanks so much. Thank you so much for listening. Head over to our website at careerjourneypodcast.com for more info, the latest episodes, and to join the discussion about careers. See you next time.